this is Dr. Abdullah Damluji. He is an interventional cardiologist and a member of the structural heart team at Inova Shaw Heart and Vascular. He's also the director of the Inova Center of Outcomes Research, dedicated to producing innovative and improving outcomes for older adults undergoing cardiovascular interventions. He is an associate professor of medicine at Johns Hopkins and a Pepper Scholar at JHU Center on Aging and Health. Dr. Damluji is a board certified cardiologist in interventional cardiology, internal medicine, echocardiography, and nuclear cardiology. He received his medical degree with honors at the University of Baghdad, a master's degree in public health with a concentration in biostatistics at Johns Hopkins. He also holds a doctoral PhD in clinical investigation from Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. Dr. Damluji sees patients in the Inova Cardiology Office in Alexandria and in the offices of the Inova Structural Heart Disease Team uh, at the Inova Specialty Center in Falls Church and at the Mark Center in Alexandria. Ooh, well, if you're not embarrassed by that wonderful uh, introduction, Dr. Dan Luzzi, the floor is yours. I'm going to uh, go into the background and uh, please uh, share your slides at this time. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Levy and Ms. Rana for this um, wonderful um, introduction. I am just going to pull my slides and I hope you can see my slides um, on the screen. Um, perfect. Again, thank yep. You got it? Okay, perfect. Thank you so much again for this uh, really uh, great opportunity to connect with our community here at uh, in Northern Virginia. I'm going to talk about the American Heart Association Life Essential Aid for older patients. Um, and uh, just to give you a context, as Dr. Levy was saying in the... Um, um, I work in the Innova Center of Outcomes Research, and we study older adults and uh, their response to therapies and the safety of these therapies um, as it relates to cardiovascular disease. Um, in the coming 35 minutes, I'm just going to um, try to illustrate to you how implementing life essentials may influence longevity and living um, in, uh, for a longer periods of, of time at a better quality of life. As you know that the United States is an aging nation, I just wanted to show you this graph, which is quite staggering. In 2016, the number of children in the United States, those are less than 18 years of age, is about 22.8%, while the number of older adults above 65 years of age is 15%. But this, um, there is a demographic shift of, of, the, of the population, whereas the number of Older adults and children will be the same by year 2035, and, and more and more older adults will continue to grow into their older years. And by 2060, the number of older adults will be more than the number of children in this country. And the graph on the right will show you that the, the orange line, which is the, and the blue line, um, is the largest, um, uh, is the sector of the community that's growing the largest as compared to younger patients over time. Um, and there are differences between young patients and old patients as they present to the hospital. Uh, you know, a young patient comes in with a heart attack, they receive therapy, they go home. While an older patients, they have chronic medical conditions, they are on several drugs, they have, you know, cognitive impairment at baseline, and we give them drugs, and that would result in some cognitive decline. They are physically inactive and they become frail as a result of hospitalization, even though they present with the same problem that a younger patient gets, they really usually do not, they show, they fall short of optimal treatment goals um, as we like them to be. And this is an example to just to illustrate an older adult who came into the, to, uh, to our institution um, with a heart attack. You see like this is the, the, the blood vessel that was occluded. We fixed the problem, but the patient was in the ICU for a long period of time, stranded with blood pressure machines, um, a breathing machine, tubes everywhere. And imagine if this older adult is living with, with age associated risks like frailty, like chronic medical conditions, they would not recover on the long run um, like a younger patient who comes in with the exact same problem. And the goal is to prevent this from happening in the first place because prevention is the best treatment. So what are the consequences of aging? 
So um, a, the, as a result of chronic medical conditions, accelerated biologic aging can happen, and that can result in cardiovascular disease. And also, there are other factors that can influence the development of cardiovascular disease. This is muscle loss, um, the, the frailty or the loss of physical function. There are a lot of older adults lose independence as a result of, of aging, and that would lead eventually to poor quality of life. And all of these are interrelated. So why does that happen in an older patient? This is an example of another patient. Both of them are the same age. Both of them, we have the ability to predict their cardiovascular risk, and they both have the same score. But you can just look at both of them, and you can see that the patient on the left side, they are, they are more robust. Uh, they have a, a better physical um, appearance of physical function than the patient on, on the right. But both of them, if we calculate their risk, if we look at their age, they are the same, but you know, phenotypically they are not the same. Um, and that happens because of multiple things that happen to us when we grow into our older uh, older years. Uh, the, the, blood the blood vessels become stiff. That results in higher uh, blood pressure. We call it syst isolated systolic hypertension. The, blood, the muscle of the heart becomes thicker. It becomes stiff and does not relax all the way. And that uh, also results in uh, problems with the ability of the heart to generate, you know, constant heart rates, um, you know, over time. And these changes affect how an older patient uh, react to any stressors that comes in, um, including cardiovascular disease. But that is not related only to the heart muscle. If you look at the brain um, of the brain muscle, uh, for younger patients and um, and an older patient, there's like shrinkage of of parts of the brain in the cortex or in some of these cavities in the brain. There's also changes in the lung function, where uh, you know the lung uh, starts uh, having um, a lower capacity. They have mucus and and clogging as as a result of a younger lung. And the same thing that happens in the heart and in the kidneys. These changes, as we grow older, makes us susceptible to to stressors and including cardiovascular illness. So the uh, the whole mark of aging starts from the cell and, and from actually from the gene, and then it goes into the cell, and then it exhibits itself into a phenotypic um, aging. But the aging process is different from me than someone else. As someone who lives a very healthy lifestyle can delay that, that expression of, bio, of biologic aging into later years, while someone who, is, who is, does not live in a healthy lifestyle can exhibit these aging processes at an earlier years. And, um, and in order to prevent um, you know, deterioration of of physical function, of cognitive function, and all sort of multi-system um, uh, diseases and deterioration, the American Heart Association came up with the life essential eight. These are eight steps that any older adult, if, if they take it religiously and implement it, they would delay the aging process and they can live healthier with a better quality of life at the later years. So I'm gonna go over these eight life essentials and um, hopefully uh, within the coming 20 minutes, just show you that the evidence of where this, this comes from. So the first life essential is being more active. So as we grow older, a lot of older adults, um, they become inactive. So in the age group between 65 to 74, about one in four patients, one in four patients have inactivity. But you see like this increases to more than 35.3% in those above 75 years of age. And this one, we're talking about inactivity, this is nine hours of sedentary time. Does these, these older patients do not, you know, they're sitting in a, on a wheelchair or sitting in, in bed or at home and they do not, um, uh, they do not, uh, uh, adhere to a higher level activity um, on a daily basis. And these are the recommended physical activity levels for both men and women. And you can see that uh, as even the younger patients from 20 to 40, they, they are not adhering to what the, um, the American Heart Association and American College of Cardiology recommend the optimal level of physical activity. But even though as we grow older, these, uh, these uh, levels of physical activity decrease, and as a result, uh, we want to ask ourselves why older adults are not 
engaging in exercise and increasing their physical activity. And there are a variety of reasons. There are musculoskeletal changes in their joints and their hips. So they have cardiovascular illness. They can have lung disease, the presence of multiple chronic conditions. So a lot of these patients are on a lot of drugs and these, these drugs affect their physical function. Obesity, sometimes the level of education and understanding the importance of being physically active. And of course, going to the hospital. All of these are factors that leads to inactivity in um, um, in inactivity um, in among older patients, but we know from our research that exercise um, increases. Uh, they have positive effects on the blood vessels. They have positive effects on the components of each cell, and also have an anti-inflammatory effects in the in in the system. And that leads to better cardiovascular outcomes. I mean, Dr. Levy also can tell you he's been in practice for a very long time. Those who have very high exercise capacity, even if they have really high burden of disease, they do very well. Even if they have really high burden of disease, they do very well. So exercise and physical activity um, uh, is quite important. And if we go to the American Heart Association recommendation for physical exercise for older adults, and thus we're talking about anyone who is above 65 years of age, they say 150 minutes of moderate physical activity or 75 minutes of vigorous physical activity per week. And if you, if I look at myself and, you know, I sometimes you, life is busy, you can adhere to these, to these uh, high, high level of, of physical function. But we know that the higher the level of physical function, as I said, there's lower risk of mortality, the higher risk, the higher level of physical function. If you can, if you're able to get into vigorous levels, there is much lower risk of uh, mortality and cardiovascular mortality. Um, so the, the recommendations for both young patients and old patients are the same. Um, the main goal is to avoid inactivity. We cannot sit in, 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 in the house for nine hours without moving. That's the main goal. But um, And for those who have um, restrictions like musculoskeletal uh, disease and joint problems, you know, having exercises with motion exercises, controlled breathing, stretching, and yoga can, uh, can be an alternative, you know, solution for, for avoiding inactivity. And as I said, the, 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 in order to reduce cardiovascular mortality and all cause mortality, endurance exercises and cardiorespiratory fitness is essential. So these are the main recommendations for the first uh, which is uh, increasing physical activity. The second is eating better. So um, the diet is a tough issue. I'm not a dietitian, but um, I'm, I'm just gonna recite what the American Heart Association is uh, recommending in this gray, in this in this area, mainly whole grains, fruits and vegetables, lean proteins, nuts, seeds, and also um, cooking in in non tropical oils such as um, olive oil or, or canola. And um, but our diet is is quite variable between one person to another. And if you look at the percentages of these whole grains, fruits and vegetables, and lean proteins. In, in in diets by age group, it's really we're not adhering to that to that um, to these recommendations. And our diet is mainly um, composed of processed food and a lot of glucose and sugars in it. Um, so uh, diet is as a healthier diet are is associated with cardiovascular uh, disease prevention. And some of the studies showed improvement in overall mortality. It, a better diet with high proteins in it can prevent muscle loss. This is called sarcopenia and can indirectly influence physical function or what we call frailty. It can also influence cognitive and mental health. Mainly those who are malnourished, those who have really bad diets can get into uh, cognitive issues and also can prevent the need for polypharmacy or multiple medications because of, of, um, of multiple chronic conditions. So um, the, the concern here is to prevent poor diets and also to prevent malnutrition. Malnutrition in older adults above 75 years of age varies depending on the population, but it can reach up to 50% in, in certain subgroups, mainly those who have cardiovascular illnesses, so those who have prior history of a heart attack or uh, have history of heart failure. Um, so the, the, uh, the diet also, there are 
um, on top of the actual diet, the timing of the diet is important. The content of the diet is important. Having fibers, antioxidants, and 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 adherence to these uh, metrics is important too to lower long-term risk. This is a busy slide, and I don't mean to get it technical, but the main idea here is sometimes caloric restriction and intermittent fasting may influence the uh, body weight and body composition, and also can influence the 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 percent of fat and inflammation in the in the system. So in certain patients, caloric restriction and intermittent fasting may have some benefits. Um, the main diets I want to uh, focus on here is the Mediterranean diet, which is a, a diet um, that is uh, mainly whole grains, vegetables, and fruits, uh, seafood and fish, uh, potatoes, olive oil, beans, um, nuts, and seeds. These are associated with improved cardiovascular health and lower blood pressure on, on long-term follow-up. And DASH diet that has similar components, which is kind of Mediterranean diet, has also been um, associated with improved outcomes. The third um, life essential is managing weight. And, and this is interrelated with the diet and physical activity. Uh, the goal is to have a healthy weight, uh, more of muscle mass, less of fat mass. Um, and as uh, a lot of uh, older patients are obese and their weight is mainly composed of fat tissue and it's not composed of muscle tissue. Um, and that's uh, that's what we call sarcopenic obesity, basically losing muscle mass, but at the same time they are obese or overweight because of fat uh, muscle. And the and this is just a picture on the um, on the right to show you what the one in orange here that shows you the normal muscle. And in an older adult, you see like the muscle, which is the uh, the orange here, is much smaller, and a lot of uh, fat deposition becomes larger around these muscles. And this happens throughout the body and mainly around around the the abdominal area, and that leads to frailty and and decrease uh, decrease physical function. Um, so mainly the goal here with aging and with inactivity and with poor diet and chronic medical conditions, a lot of adipose tissue, which is fat tissue, gets deposited in the in the in the body, and then a lot of muscle mass gets lost, and that can lead to uh, sarcopenic obesity, which is associated with inflammation and and problems down the line related to cardiovascular illness. Um, the, the treatment for this is mainly uh, diet um, and preventing malnutrition, uh, having a, uh, a 500 to 700 kilocalorie per day deficit is important, and also having a relatively uh, higher protein, lean protein, about one gram per kilogram uh, per day is important to preventing muscle loss. Um, vitamin D in those who are deficient and calcium in those who are deficient and mainly in older adults may prevent, um, may prevent other uh, problems re related to, to sarcopenic obesity. The fourth life essential is managing blood sugars. And um, dysregulated blood glucose, the glucose that the higher blood glucose and insulin resistance occurs with aging. This is a map of the United States uh, coming from 2004 to 2016, the uh, the darker colors showing higher glucose um, glucose in in the in the community, and you can see like and even in this short time frame, not I'm not going back to the 1970s. You see that the map is changing, where a lot of populations living in the United States living with insulin resistance, and and with higher glucose levels, and these uh, lead to pre diabetes and and diabetes and mainly affects older patients above 65 years of age. And as we age, as I said, this uh, adipose deposition, which is fat muscle, depos uh, fat deposited in the muscles that happens with aging leads to insulin resistance, increasing inflammatory uh, increasing in, in inflammation and and leads to diabetes. And diabetes leads to all sorts of problems. And these problems are uh, mainly cardiovascular and um, including coronary disease, including atrial fibrillation, which is like a regular heart rhythm, um, you know, and other problems, you know, um, retinopathy, renal disease, cognitive impairment, and that leads to polypharmacy, a lot of drugs to manage the diabetes. And it's just a, a problem that if we prevent, we can uh, solve many problems that can happen in, an, in the older adult population.
Okay, so um, uh, glycemic targets um, is a is, uh, complex issue, but uh, the glycated uh, hemoglobin A1c in those who have uh, intact cognitive function, intact physical function should be less than 7%. And uh, those who have multiple chronic illnesses, we give them a little bit of leeway, uh, speci specifically cognitive impairment or functional in, uh, dependence on others. Uh, the, the glycated hemoglobin A1C goal should be less than 8%. There are newer drugs. Uh, there are older drugs like metformin, but there are newer drugs that are associated with improved outcomes, mainly in patients with cardiovascular disease, the GLP-1 and the SGLT-2. Again, you don't need to know about these, but these are newer drugs that are associated with improved gly glycemic control and improve, improved outcomes, including all-cause mortality. Okay, the, the fifth um, uh, life essential is managing blood pressure. Uh, the ideal blood pressure in all of us is 120, less than 120 over 80. However, if you look at, um, again, uh, the, the targets and the population, you see that uh, these targets are not achieved um, in most of, of, uh, the, uh, of, the, uh, of patients across different age groups. Uh, the, you know, the, uh, most of our patients are on multiple medications trying to control them, but we're still not able to get into 80% control uh, of achieving a blood pressure less than 120 over 80. So the prevalence of high blood pressure is about 80% in those above 75 years of age. So it's a very uh, prevalent problem in the community. And mainly it happens when the higher number, the systolic blood pressure, the higher number is high and the lower number is normal. So you see a lot of our patients having 160 over 70. 170 over 80, and um, and that's as a result of the blood, pr uh, the 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 vessels become stiffer with time, and because of the stiffness, the blood pressure goes uh, goes up and affects multiple organ systems, including the kidneys and the heart and also the the brain. Um, so, is uh, lowering the blood pressure less than 120 over 80 in older adults beneficial? For the mostly, the answer is yes. There are subgroups of patients that cannot tolerate very low blood pressures, but we know from clinical trials that very low blood pressure, 120 over 80, is associated with improved outcomes in, um, in all comers. Everyone, you know, and you take the average of the population, a lot of them get improvement from their blood pressure. But there are certain elderly, uh, frail older adults with cognitive impairments um, um, or multiple chronic conditions or on multiple medications, polypharmacy, they cannot tolerate very low blood pressure like this. And we have some uh, permissibility where we give them a blood, pre a blood pressure, you know, closer to 140 over, over 90. And we say in those patients, this is acceptable. Uh, these are the trials that have been done on blood pressure since 1985. The most recent is the SPRINT trial that were, was done in 2016. And that showed that the target blood pressure of 120 over 90, less than 120 over 90, is, is associated with improved cardiovascular mortality and improved all-cause mortality. Okay, so um, uh, there are several types of drugs that can lower blood pressure. One of them is the angiotensin converting enzyme inhibitor, um, uh, angiotensin re uh, receptor blockers, the calcium channel blockers, diuretics. Some of them uh, have some side effects that um, uh, that and that an older adult may experience more than a younger patient. So this is need to be uh, directed by the patient's cardiologist and their own physician. The um, the sixth um, life essential is actually sleep health. Um, so the sleeping is a complex issue, and it it um, requ it requires attention to timing, the continuity of the sleep, the duration of the sleep, the alertness during the waking uh, hours, and also satisfaction with the quality of the sleep. And there is a uh, U-shape association between uh, sleep and cardiovascular illness. So lower uh, hours of sleep, that's you know in the on the left side of the graph is associated with higher all-cause mortality. Those who don't sleep, they more likely die earlier than those who have normal patterns of sleep. Those who can achieve seven to eight hours, they have the lowest, um, maybe six to eight hours, they have the lowest mortality. And, and as you know, those who sleep more than eight hours, and mainly those are the sicker, older patients with multiple comorbidities, their risk of mortality goes up exponentially. And that's uh, the same for cardiovascular death and cardiovascular risk overall. 
Um, same thing with coronary heart disease. Um, you know, it has a U shape. So this association has been reproduced in our research um, in, in multiple cohorts, uh, emphasizing the importance of sleep. Uh, sleep is um, associated with by multiple comorbidities, diabetes, hypertension, coronary heart disease, stroke, and this can lead to sleep disturbances, uh, multiple um, episodes of waking during the night, um, and um, it can also be influenced by poor diet quality. Um, those who have poor physical activity and they don't go out during the day and come back, you know, and they have regular uh, waking cycles, they have disturbed sleep. So multiple things affect uh, the quality of our sleep. So as a result, uh, the, the solution for having a better sleep is multi-component. And uh, we have to always ask about these components to have a uh, healthy sleep habits. These are how often do you get take naps? Um, how is there any substance abuse or alcohol, excessive alcohol, sometimes uh, taking in excessive fluids or having diuretics or sometimes prostate medications can wake up an older patients in the middle of the night frequently and disturb their sleep. They have uh, stress and medications. Um, and then uh, those who have, as I said, uh, physical inactivity, uh, they have poor quality of sleep. So addressing all these components would be would be um, uh, critical. And we have a sleep center, a large sleep center here at Inova, that really they do a phenomenal job in addressing all these issues, mainly for older patients. And if these don't work, there are drugs that can that have low side effects and uh, can also help with, with sleeping, knowing that we have to avoid narcotics, we have to avoid benzodiazepines because these are addictive and we're moving to uh, less uh, toxic medications, um, particularly in older adults who are um, vulnerable to stressors. Okay, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm trying to get on time. So uh, the, uh, the seventh life essential is mainly smoking. Smoking is, as we know, is bad. Um, and But um, about 12% of, Adults above 65 years of age still smoke, um, and it is much lower than younger cohorts, but still that's a sizable one in 10, almost one in 10 uh, older adults we see, they still smoke. And with smoking, uh, one cigarette can cause 1 trillion free, radical, free radicals per inhalation um, in um uh, in, the, in the bloodstream. And uh, that's quite toxic, not only to 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 the cells, but it's also toxic to the genome and it's toxic to the part of the cell that is responsible for our aging. So you see that those who smoke phenotypically, how they exhibit themselves, they look much uh, much older than, than their counterparts who do not smoke, uh, everything else, you know, constant. And um, uh, that can also lead to excessive morbidity and also excessive mortality at even at younger ages. Um, it can, and if those who do not um, experience higher risk of mortality, they get cardiovascular disease, they get pulmonary disease like obstructive lung disease, and sometimes they get cancer. And in aggregate, there's uh, 10 years less life, um, less quality of life, and less life duration than those who do not smoke on average. Um, so um, the smoking overall, we encourage the cessation of smoking. Um, and even at later stages of, of someone who smoked all their life, even stopping it today will influence their risk of coronary artery disease, MI, and stroke, um, even though they, they have smoked for a long time. Their risk is much lower than those who continue to smoke. Uh, the challenges in, in smoking are, are inter- um, Connected and they're difficult. The habitual smoking, um, you know, sometimes you have uh, resistance uh, phenotypes of those who cannot really cannot uh, got, get off uh, the cravings. And um, and if that doesn't happen, we in practice see a short term decline in both uh, physical function, so mus the muscle, the muscle and cogn and cognitive abilities as as we as we follow them. So there are nicotine patch patches and drugs that are uh, also available that can help. Um, uh, is the smoking cessation process, and this you have to talk to your doctor for for uh, prescribing these because these are uh, important um, issues uh, related to uh, smoking. Okay, the last one is high cholesterol and um, high cholesterol hyperlipidemia. Um, if we look at uh, where we want the low density lipoprotein, which is the bad cholesterol to be in older adults between 65 to 79 years of age, we're about 
50% uh, we're not achieving these targets, the goals of the ACC and the American Heart Association goal targets. Um, as we age, lipid metab metabolism changes also. And uh, this is a graph just to show you that the triglycerides, for example, as we age for both men and women, um, the, the, it goes up um, uh, because our metabolism slows down and some of these lipids accumulate over time. And, and the association with cardiovascular disease among older adults is mixed, but uh, recent data has showed that there is a inverse association between the bad cholesterol, the low density lipoprotein and mortality in older adults. This is um, the, uh, I'll show you the data in a second, but the uh, lipid lowering uh, medications and those who have uh, very high cholesterol above uh, 190 for the bad cholesterol may be beneficial in reducing risk, factor, risk factors. Statins are the main drugs that are used to reduce cholesterol, but they have side effects in, in older adults that I will go over. Um, this is a meta-analysis uh, where uh, they took all the studies that studied uh, patients above 65, uh, 65 to 70 here and more than 70, and here uh, you see that the placebo is better. And you see on the left side that the drug is better, mainly statin. And this box is does not um, overlap that line of one. And there is an in aggregate benefits of statin in preventing all cause mortality in those who have higher cholesterol um, and also preventing heart attacks and strokes and cardiovascular mortality. Um, um, in, in this cohort. Another study that also looked at this um, recently also reaffirmed this data. However, in older patients who are frail, they have multiple chronic conditions, they may have side effects of statins. They may have muscle spasms. Some of them have liver disease. Some of them uh, can be affected by cost. And um, that you know becomes um, sometimes a, a discussion with the physician whether a statin should be started in these patients. But overall, there is modest impact on longevity and preventing cardiovascular disease, stroke, and shared decision-making with the physician and with the cardiologist is, is quite critical. Uh, so these are the eight um, uh, life essentials that uh, the American Heart Association always uh, emphasizes in our meeting, it's never too late to start them and focus on them to um, prevent major problems, including cardiovascular disease as we grow older. And these um, have been, you know, even implementing them in younger patients is, is critical to prevent deterioration and progression of physical decline at, at um, older age. Thank you again for giving me this opportunity. I'm really, um, uh, you know, honored to be connected to our community and I will take any question from Dr. Levy and uh, and from Ms. Rana. Well, that, that was great, Abdul, thank you. Yeah, if you can uh, stop sharing your slides so we get to see your beautiful face here in, in a bigger bigger <laughs> square, thank you. Yeah. Um, that was great, that's a lot of information uh, and there are a bunch of questions and I'm gonna try to start putting them together and, and I'm gonna I'm gonna stick with cholesterol so you finished with cholesterol and I think there there are a couple of questions about cholesterol one one that I had that will lead into others and and I have I'm not sure what to do right is a lot of times you know anyone who has vascular disease anyone who has blockages anywhere they all need to be on a set and they all need to get their cholesterol down. But what we're talking about is treating people who we don't know that they have vascular disease. And we have things that are risk calculators that we can put patients into that tell us who should be treated and who may not need to be treated. But the problem is, as you get older, you're almost always going to have a greater than 10% risk, simply because age is an important component. So the question is, you know, can we use those risk calculators to really tell us who should be on statins above a certain age? Should we be treating primary prevention above a certain age without other risk factors? Or, you know, is there no downside and why not? I mean, what, that's sort of a loaded question. but, what Very, do you think? but Yeah, these are all tough issues. And actually, one of my co collaborators, Dr. Daniel Foreman, he's a, a cardiologist who is, uh, specializes on aging, is writing a document on the prevention. What what does it mean to have to prevent illness in an older patient? For younger patients, we have major adverse cardiovascular events and we have mortality. But for an older patient, it's more, way more complex. 
there is prevention of disability, there is a pre uh, prevention of dependence on others, there is a prevention of the same metrics that we use for younger patients. These risk calculators do not reflect the same risk in older patients because the cohorts that are used to develop these risk scores were all come from mid-age patients, 40s and 50s and 60s. But now, as I said in the presentation, a lot of our patients are 75 and 80, and we have to say, okay, should we put someone on a statin or not? And that brings another complexity on, on prevention. Now, biomarkers help. So first, if the LDL cholesterol is quite high, above 190, there is reasonable evidence that we should start a statin as a primary prevention strategy. Now, there are other metrics that, um, for example, the use of the advancement in imaging. Now we have coronary calcium score and sometimes coronary CTs and some patients that they get, we can uh, at least have a reasonable understanding of whether someone has coronary disease, if someone has uh, vascular disease, and that would increase their risk. And sometimes there are higher risk cohorts, those who have carotid disease, diabetes, these should be on statin for primary prevention. Now, for someone who's adhering with the life essentials, who's completely healthy, who can go into high workload, their labs is completely normal. As you said, Dr. Levian, you have decades more experience than me. Uh, the, the answer is quite as wise, um, gray, um, not very uh, conclusive. You just, you just called me old for the second no, time. No, you have a lot of get away with this. <laughs> <laughs> um, someone asked a, a good cholesterol question. So does LP little a, that's a sub-segment of your lipids, does that have as strong a predictive value in the elderly as it does in a younger population? Well, um, you know, I the LP little a, usually it exhibits itself in younger cohorts, and uh, especially with those who have really extensive coronary artery disease, stroke, or, or vascular disease, and uh, they keep coming back to the hospital several times, and then they check their or the 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 panel, the lipid panel, and the, everything is okay-ish, but they keep coming back. Then we check it and we find a very high LP little a, and that needs treatment. Um, in certain subgroups, the answer is yes. Uh, for example, Southeast Asians, they have very high risk of developing cardiovascular disease as a result of LP little a. Um, so LP little a is something we think about in in resistant disease and those who come in with very high cardiovascular burden. If you agree, Dr. Levy. Yeah, I do. I do. And it, 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 it's just one piece of the puzzle in making decision making. And each patient is, in, is, you know, is an individual and we have to look at all of the risk factors uh, that go into that decision making. You know, you mentioned something quickly in passing and I'm going to ask you to come back because I find this extremely helpful in almost all ages. And that's a coronary calcium score. It's a very simple test. It's very inexpensive. I won't get up on my soapbox in terms of why uh, it's not paid for as a diagnostic study, it should be. It's a great way to screen for, for heart disease. But do you use coronary calcium scores to help sort of break the tie for that patient who has the LDL of 130 or 140 or even 120? Uh, yes, absolutely. I mean, if we go by the prevention guidelines, they say, yes, it's a, it's a metric that we use to help us make decisions. And coronary calcium score is important. Um, now, if you look at older adults, most of them have ranges of coronary calcium score between 300 and 500. Uh, but when it's, when it's above 1,000 or above 500, I would definitely treat. Um, again, that discussion should be between the the physician and the patient, so that you know other factors can play a role, family history and other symptoms, etc. So Stephen wants to know, and uh, he wants to exercise seventy-five minutes a week and not one hundred and fifty. So he wants to know how do you define vigorous exercise versus just kind of going out and taking that walk outside? Sounds good. That's perfect. So um, these, <laughs> I mean, from scientific standpoint, we we define them by uh, metabolic units. Um, we have a standardized way of measuring. How, my, how many um, units of energy someone can can burn um, in, in a standardized way on a, on a treadmill at a certain inclination and a certain speed. Um, I, I mean, the, the, in, in, in real life, uh, you know, my vigorous activity is, is different than Michael Phelps and different than others. So uh, I would, you know, as long as you are able to raise your heart rate above 120 to, to 150, now everyone has Apple watches, you know, that I would consider that vigorous, um, vigorous activity sure. as, as long as there's no, no, no symptoms. 
Right. I'll, I'll throw in that your peak predicted heart rate is around 220 minus your age. So if you're 80, you're probably not going to get your heart rate to 150. So don't don't feel like you're not doing enough. Um, a, a couple of a, a good question here. So, you know, for someone who has some heart failure, um, oh, actually, I'm going to recite your eight because there was a question. Please repeat the eight. And Rana, maybe you can put this in the chat, but let's see if I was paying attention. It goes something like exercise, diet weight, controlling your sugars, blood pressure, sleep, don't smoke, and watch your lipids. That's Those are the eight. So perfect. someone asked us to repeat that. So uh, someone with heart failure, you know, what can they do to reduce their risk, improve their quality of life? How do these eight things play for them? Yes. So they are all interrelated. Um, now we are in the uh, secondary prevention type of phase. Um, what I was talking about, someone has no diseases and we're trying to prevent deterioration in cardiovascular health and we're trying to deteriorate um, aging associated health. Um, but in, in those who have illnesses that are pre-existing, they benefit the same amount and sometimes more, they have more benefits if they apply rigorous you know, uh, physical activity, uh, they apply um, you know, blood pressure controls, statin control, et cetera. And in aggregate, these patients would would benefit even more because they have already cardiovascular illness, including heart failure. So just keeping it simple, I think they benefit and we should, you know, advocate for, you know, adhering to these metrics um, uh, to a larger degree than someone who has no illnesses. Sure. A um, couple of questions about diet and, and dieting. Um, you know, what are your thoughts? And I, you're not a dietitian, um, and, and this isn't the area that I think we we really specialize in, but um, extreme dieting, uh, you know, fasting, um, even keto diets. Um, do you have any thoughts about that versus just sort of a heart healthy diet? Yeah. So I'll, I'll tell you what, um, you know, this is a very controversial, you put it on Google, you'll get all sort of information. Someone will say, eat only meat, you'll live longer. And someone will say, oh, eat only glucose, you'll live longer, etc. cetera. Um, but uh, I'll tell you what the evidence says. And this, uh, there, are, there are two major clinical trials. One look at Mediterranean diet, one look at the DASH diet. The DASH diet have low salt, but mainly the same components, grains, nuts, fish, mainly uh, fish and grains and proteins. And uh, these are associated with better outcomes. Um, now, other diets like keto diets or other forms of diets, you know, are less uh, studied rigorously. You know, Mediterranean diet and DASH diet is the best evidence we have. As, as you know, if you randomize someone to a DASH diet versus no DASH diet, the adherence is difficult. You know, whoever, all of us, we cheat. So it's, you know, the studies have their problems, but that's the best evidence we have that it improves outcomes. Now, intermittent fasting and and um, it can be beneficial mainly in overweight patients, those who have diabetes, those who have insulin resistance. That's one way of tackling metabolic health. Um, and it's, and there are there is, you know, a body of evidence that's associated with improved outcomes. Sure. Jesse asked a, a great question, and I think we all get this a lot. Um, there's a lot of high blood pressure out there. Patients are taking a lot of high blood pressure medicines. Is it better for them to take the medicine in the morning, in the evening? Um, and maybe also just, uh, I'm going to throw in a question about sort of white, white coat syndrome. You know, a patient who comes to the doctor's office, their blood pressure is high. Does that make the diagnosis, or do you need more information? We'll we'll do both of those. How's that? Uh, absolutely. So in this uh, on Wednesday, this past Wednesday, I had a clinic, and I have this patient I've been following for five years, and and every time he comes to the clinic, his blood pressure is one eighty, and he goes, "Let me show you my recording at home," and he gives me these pages, a copy book of blood pressures, all one ten, one twenties. So yeah, I, I, white coat syndrome is there. I, I don't doubt it. People get anxious when they come into clinic. They are running, especially older patients. You know, they're, they're going fast so they don't miss appointments. They, they can't find their medicines and that raises some of everyone's blood pressure. Um, so the, when we take blood pressure medicine is, um, you know, depending on the drug, depending on how many blood pressure medications we take, some of them are twice a day medications. Some of them are extended release where they go into the blood at slower intervals throughout the day. Um, it, 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 um, but mainly is if, if it's as long as these medications cover the bioavailability, which is the availability of this drug in the blood, 
24 seven that that achieves best blood pressure control. Yeah, I'd, I'd probably also throw in if you're wondering, you know, start measuring your blood pressures yourself at home, measure them in the morning, measure them late in the day, and then take them into your physician. Because sometimes there are patients who develop very high blood pressure when they're up with, when they wake up in the morning, and you may want to add, you know, something late in the day. So, you know, th th there's there's an adage out there that says know your numbers. And we want patients to know their numbers. That means know your blood pressure, know your lipid profile, know your glucose level, right? Know your A1C. And that's really saying know what your risk factors are. Um, there was a question, a good question here. And since you're an interventional cardiologist, you'll love this one. Um, is And, and uh, Gregory wants to know, like, can you ever get blockages in the coronary arteries to melt away? Is there such a thing as atherosclerotic regression? There is, uh, and this is way, with this, uh, the cholesterol-lowering therapies, mainly the statins and the PCSK9 inhibitors. These are newer drugs that comes in as an injection. You take it twice uh, twice a month and um, sometimes once a month, depending on, on the drug. And these have been shown on imaging that some of these plaques, uh, they, they um they regress over time. And, you know, as Dr. Levy was also as an interventional cardiologist, so um, I, I, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but some of these, the lesions that, that we worry about the most are not the 90 plus percent or 80 percent. We, uh, some of them are, have a very soft kind of cap. And these are 10, 20%. These when they rupture into the bloodstream that causes a lot of clotting in the bloodstream. And these medications also stabilizes these, these, um, these are really minimal plaques and so that they don't rupture on the, on the long run. But I'll see what Dr. Levy says about this. You know, I, I totally agree with you, Abdullah. It's, you know, when you have plaques or blockages in your coronary arteries, people think that heart attacks are caused by a blockage that goes from 50 to 70 to 90 to 100, and that's not the case. Any plaque can rupture, and those unstable plaques are the ones that are the most dangerous. That, that you know, I totally agree with you. Someone wants to know about e-cigarettes, vaping. Does that carry the same risk as uh, tar and nicotine cigarettes? Yeah, yeah. So it all depends on the company. And I was reading about some some of this uh, recently. The concentration of the of the material they use in these vaping, no one knows what they put in into it. But I, we know that in some of the studies that came out, um, that there's been a lot of complications that's happening as a result of vaping, um, cancer, lung disease, um, and a lot of oropharyngeal issues. Um, so. Incomparable, I, I would not recommend either, uh, but um, you know, they both have negative effects overall on health, on cardiovascular health. Yeah, like just don't, right? Just don't. Um, hey, you know what topic didn't come up and, and I'm gonna throw it out there because it fits into diet and it's kind of important in terms of blood pressure and longevity, sodium. Sodium Absolutely. in the American Sorry. diet. Uh, right. The American diet is very high in sodium and most people think that that's the salt you cook with, but it's not. It comes from elsewhere. What should people know about sodium in their diet? And blood yeah, diet? so it's it's um, a lot of the processed food, processed meat is uh, preserved in salt, and these are very high concentration of sodium. And we're trying to keep the salt less than, you know, it's, uh, again, there's a lot of controversy. What is the optimal salt in patients with heart failure? We say less than two grams of salt per for, for 24 hours, but you know sometimes it's more permissive to those who does not have heart failure, but the lower the better because salt increases blood pressure, it causes water retention in the body, it can lead to long-term effect on the vascular system and, and high blood pressure. Actually, some of the patients that we see in the structural heart disease clinic, they live long lives and they have very low blood pressure. And then I ask them, I keep asking them, it's like, how did you keep, you know, not out of being on medications for, for very long periods of time. And they say, I'm, I watch my salt. I watch my salt, you know, religiously. So salt is very important, but um, most of us get salt from bread and get salt from other things that, that preserve uh, food. Um, and that we should get pay attention to, to the salt content um, in the long run. Yeah, absolutely. And what people don't know is just by reducing sodium in your diet a little bit, Reducing your blood pressure just by a couple of millimeters of mercury is going to prolong your life expectancy. Totally agree. I, uh, you know, yeah. I can, I can disagree. Yeah, I'm going to ask you a question, and I'm going to allow you to say pass. All right. Okay. Because it's but blue zones. 
people talk about blue zones, you know, the, I guess it's six areas of the world where longevity is greater. Is there, you know, do you, have, is that an area you've you've done any that you've looked into at all? And I, I'm going to allow you to pass because I find it fascinating. I mean, Loma Linda, California is one of the blue zones. I mean, there right. are places all around the world. Yeah. But what is it? Genetic? Is it diet? Is it exercise? Um, what do you so, think? So uh, I, I, you see, look, um, there are. I, I, I study aging. I love aging. You know, I was like, yeah. I. We can uh, way how we can develop uh, to uh, delay aging, biologic aging is is my goal. Okay, so if you look at certain areas, so there's a, a study in JAMA. It was published in 2018. It's really interesting. They looked at where the oldest individuals live in the United States and across the world, and in the U.S. for women is the Miami area, um, Palm Beach, and you know Greater Miami area, and for men is in New York. If you want to look it up, it's really fascinating. And then and, uh, around the world, there are areas in Japan and areas in southern Italy. And then they started describing their habits, you see? And then it goes back to these life aids. You know, they don't have blood pressure. They're lean. They're walking. There is, you know, less smoking. They, uh, you know, they're active. They have less comorbidities. They live long lives. And, you know, you can extrapolate some of this from their patterns uh, of, of living. While if you go in unfortunate areas of the U.S., in the mid mid section of the United States, you know they're 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 stranded at home. They have to drive. They have multiple chronic conditions, obesity. It's it's a different demographic, I think. Yeah, I hope yeah. you agree. It's multifactorial, and multifactorial. You're talking about those very high HDL places in Italy. Um, and another topic that I think is worth touching upon, and, and there are a couple of questions that that touch on them: stress. Right, stress. Uh, how does that affect us from a cardiovascular standpoint, inflammatory standpoint? And the other thing that has also been shown to correlate with longevity is having a support system, having having a community around you, having a posse. Right. And so, how do those things affect our health? Uh, is interrelated. Stress increases inflammation in the body, and we know cardiovascular disease is an inflammatory process. The people who live under constant stress, you know, unfortunately, they develop more events. And social support system is so important for older patients. Now, in our clinical trials, one of the main uh, uh, inclusion criteria is having a, so a social support system. When you come to Innova, the first thing we ask you, where do you live? Who do you live with? Who drives you around? Who takes care of you? And, uh, you know, and we see that those patients do the best um, on the long term, on the long term follow up. Yeah. Um, it, it is. It's just one of those things that really correlates with good health activity and, and everything. Um, blood pressure and atrial fibrillation. Um, is there a relationship? There is a relationship. It's, um, as I said, isolated blood pressure comes from isolated systolic hypertension, which is the, the, the higher number is high. The lower number is normal. The, the blood vessels become stiff and calcified. The heart muscle becomes um, really thick and does not relax. The pressure inside the heart goes up. Then the atriums, which are the upper chambers of the heart, start dilating, start getting inf inflamed, and then you develop the arrhythmia. It is related as everything is interrelated. And that's when, if, if you tackle these life essential eight uh, systematically, you constantly reduce risk across different domains of, of cardiovascular uh, disease. Yeah. Someone asked, uh, I guess, for me to repeat those, like when I say know your numbers, uh, what numbers are we talking about? We're talking about your blood pressure, your weight, your cholesterol, and your good cholesterol, the HDL, and the bad cholesterol, the LDL. What your hemoglobin A1C is, that's a measure of long-term sugar glucose control. Um, and uh, what did I leave out? Uh, diabetes, uh, lipids. Physical activity. Right, physical activity. Yeah. So you want to know know your numbers and know where you sit in terms of uh, risk. Is there is there such a thing as having an HDL that's too high? And I think we we see a lot of patients who come in they have an HDL of seventy, but an LDL of one fifty, um, and they say, "Well, my HDL is high. I'm okay." Yeah. So uh, the higher, the better. <laughs> so there are, as Dr. Levy was saying, populations around the world that live with very high cholesterol, uh, HDL cholesterol, and they have very low cardiovascular risk. And this is genetic. Now, there are trials that try to increase HDL 
in, in, in certain patients, and that did not translate to improve the outcomes. But HDL in general is a good thing when we see it. It subtracts from the bad cholesterol. Every 10 subtracts 10 from the uh, LDL cholesterol, which is the bad cholesterol. Yeah. Um, labile hypertension. And what I mean mm -hmm. by that is blood pressure that it might be okay today, tomorrow it's really high, the next right. day it's low. Um, those patients obviously pose a, a challenge in mm -hmm. terms of therapy, but is there any prognostic um, you know, uh, information associated with really labile, difficult to control, high and low blood pressure? Yeah, there is. Um, uh, this comes from the SPRINT trial. Those who have labile blood pressure, really, they do worse over time because the ability to control their blood pressures in acceptable parameters it becomes more difficult. Sometimes you drop their blood pressure too low and they become lightheaded and dizzy. Sometimes you permit higher blood pressure for longer periods of time and that gets them into trouble. And the, the advent of... Um, of extended release medications. These you take once in the morning and they release in the blood slowly uh, helps a bit, but there are hypertension centers and we're starting one here at Innova uh, to include renal denervation, which may also help in this, in this domain. Um, it is difficult um, disease, but uh, luckily it's a subset of patients. Most of our patients don't have this problem. Real quickly, I, I, you again just kind of blew past something that people probably don't know what it is, renal denervation. This is an, a, an old procedure that's come back. It's now a new procedure with better, tech, better technology behind it. But for patients who have very difficult to control high blood pressure, there is now an interventional procedure we can do, which is pretty simple, that can have a significant benefit on reducing blood pressure and reducing the need for certain medications. Um, last question. Um, where was it? Uh, oh, yeah, I know what it was. It was one that Rana sent in. Here we go. This will be a real quick answer. Rana oh, sent this one uh -huh. in. And, and this isn't about her. This is about a friend. Right? <laughs> okay, about a friend. Okay. It says, <laughs> if I'm already 80, uh -huh. what are the odds that I'm going to live another 10 years? Yeah. So, I mean, if if you get to 80, you have the highest probability of getting to 100 because you got to 80, you know, so this is called That's conditional right. probability. We got to the gates. So you can you can get it to a hundred. Those who have unfortunately those who have higher disease burden, they don't get to eighty. You see, so we have to push prevention in older patients. There you go, Doctor Demluji. This has been great. Uh, we're we're out of time at this point. I want to thank you very much for making this a very entertaining and educational evening. I